What a bitch, am I right? <laughs> That's Seth Rogen and James Franco from the movie The Interview. No, you're not right. He's not being a bitch. He's completely right. He's motherfucking peanut butter and jealous. He's not jealous. He's putting talking about haters. Now, the interview I have coming up with Jeffrey Martin is quite long, extensive, talks about a million different things, if you will. But one of the points I had to pull out because it just intrigues me is the hater aspect of it. Here's a guy who, by all accounts, has made some major strides in advancing the ball in terms of our understanding of consciousness and more importantly, our understanding of how the transcending of consciousness in a kind of non-dual way relates to well-being. So there's some social science research combined with some practical shut up and meditate stuff that is truly stunning. But hate is going to hate. It's so unique what you've done. We just can't stress that enough. Whether people like it or don't like it, whether you're that grumpy Buddhist neuroscience type who's sitting there going, this isn't it, or whether you're a spiritual seeker who's so attached to your own tradition that you feel like this guy is going to take the secret sauce out of what you already know. There's all sorts of reasons to be a hater on this stuff, and I'm sure you've encountered all of them. Yeah, you know, we have a scientific framework, not a religious framework, right? I'm not a religious scholar. You know, we have had such a massive amount of hostility directed at us in recent years as we've conducted these experiments and as we've been sort of more routinely transitioning people from these various systems. And we've done, I feel like, a lot of outreach. We've allowed a lot of people from those systems to use our programs for free or even subsidizing them in other ways or even adapting things in other ways and allowing them to run them in person because they're more comfortable running things in person. You know, I feel like we've done as much as we can do to really sort of reach out. And yet there's still just such hostility that comes from those folks. And, you know, I, I mean, how happy can you really be if you're that hostile? If you're really experiencing this stuff, it's hard to be that hostile. Like I said, there's a lot to this interview, and I'm tempted to stack up a bunch of clips so you listen to what I think are all the most important parts of this interview. But I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to throw it to the wind and see what you pull out of it. Stick around. My interview with Dr. Jeffrey Martin is up next on Skeptico. Today's guest has a new book titled The Finders. Now, let me read you a couple of blurbs from the back of this book. The first is from renowned neuropsychiatrist, Dr. Peter Fennick. If a Nobel Prize existed for psychology, the work done by Dr. Jeffrey Martin and his team would be a strong contender. Again, that's from Peter Fennick. Next, from well-known consciousness researcher, Dr. Alan Combs. In this book, Dr. Martin takes his place beside William James and Abram Maslow to give us one of the most important and groundbreaking works on consciousness and human potential. Heady stuff. Dr. Jeffrey Martin, welcome back to Skeptico. So great to have you here. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. It's wonderful to see you again. Likewise. And I'm not really trying to make light of that at all. I, I think that that really puts this in context. Whether you agree with those blurbs or not, they're blurbs unlike... <laughs> Unlike blurbs I've read, Nobel Prize, William James Maslow, what does that feel like for you? So we're going to talk about this finders course. We had you on a few years ago. You were in the middle of it. You had it up and going and it was running, but it just keeps gaining a lot of momentum. What's going on, Jeffrey Martin? <laughs> Well, of course, most of those people we've had relationships with for, you know, over 10 years. Um, and so they've been trying their very best to get us to put out more and more and more information from our data for a very long time. So basically, people have been super excited and thrilled, you know, when they got a copy of that book in their hands because, you know, they've been waiting for it, frankly, for so long. 
Uh, and so if you actually if you go to the findersbook.com, I think is the website, you'll you can see even more. I mean, it's it's a crazy array of people from the head of the Transpersonal Psychology Association to Deepak Chopra to, you know, Peter Fenwick, like you said, to just sort of you name it, Andy Newberg. Um, I mean, there's like no corner of this world that has sort of left out. Uh, which is, you know, wonderful. We're super grateful for that. But of course, these have been people that we've, you know, generally worked in some way with for a very, very long time, interfaced with and been involved in either their research or their and our research or both. Uh, so these, it's, you know, it's a, it's a set of longstanding um, relationships where we're absolutely as enthusiastic about them and what they do uh, with their research and their work as we are with ours. The, the one, the, you know, the one decision that we made actually was to go with um, testimonials that were primarily from people that were involved on the science. Yes. Let me jump in there, though, because I'm afraid that I may have jumped people right into the middle of this thing, and we <laughs> need to maybe back up. Sure. Who is, for those folks who don't remember, who is... Dr. Jeffrey Martin, and what is this finders thing about? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, it's funny. I don't feel that relevant in the whole thing, ironically. I feel like uh, I've sort of just been taken along on this journey that started about 12 years ago. Really, it started, I would say, about 15 years ago. I was researching uh, things like synchronicity and whatnot. Back then, I was primarily an entrepreneur, uh, not so much a researcher, and uh, I, you know, built a bunch of companies and done all sorts of stuff in the media. Um, but for all of that success, fundamentally, I, I was not unhappy, but it just seemed like there were a lot of people that were happier than I was. And given that I was working, you know, all day, I felt quite hard and that I'd done everything that I'd been told was supposed to be the things that made you very happy. Uh, it didn't seem really fair <laughs> that, I, that I wasn't happier, right? Or that there were all these other people that were happier than I was. Um, and so I really sort of set out on a quest to figure that out. And uh, that, you know, here we are uh, over a dozen years later, but a dozen years into this project. Um, and so up to that point, I'd done what everybody had done, right? I mean, I'd taken a zillion seminars. I'd read my way through all of the world's philosophies and religions and practiced stuff here and there. And, um, you know, I, I mean, I was decades into that type of search for well-being, and I'd sort of come to the place where I felt like there really weren't any answers in any of those directions. I'd given up on all of that for all of that you know, intense amount of effort. Um, and it just occurred to me that, you know, I probably was either going to take one of a few tracks. Um, at that time, one of the world's largest media companies had um, a senior executive position open to sort of consolidate and invent the next generation of media. Uh, so I was thinking about that offer, which would have seen me going to New York, which was not where the power base of that company was. And so that didn't seem like politically the best decision, but it did seem like an interesting job, right? Um, or continue to do the same thing with my companies, um, or really just saying, you know, I've got to make a major life shift here and go try to figure this out, which is exactly what I did. And so I really just sort of liquidated everything and, uh, I went back to school and I picked up training in neuroscience and psychology and qualitative research. Um, I tried to go to sort of the best institutions for each one of those different things. And then from there, um, set out on this course of research of trying to find the happiest people that I could to see if I could possibly become one of them <laughs> and join their ranks. And you're leaving a couple of parts out of the story that we kind of cover more in the first interview, so I don't want to rehash all of that. But one is that you have a certain amount of baggage that you're bringing with you from a spiritual standpoint in terms of your upbringing. And we all do, but but that's there for you, and, and that's really cool. And number two is you're putting it out there pretty good about who you are, but you're still, in a way, being humble. I mean, you've done some pretty amazing things before this, you know, and you've 
written and you've accomplished both in the business world as well as kind of in some of these other worlds. And, and then I guess the other thing is, you know, you get into and you're going to be a social scientist, right? So all of a sudden you're at Harvard and you're at over on the West Coast, we're at Cal. Uh, at CIS. CIS, you know. The number, I think, which is, I think, the number one quanti qualitative school in the world for qualitative research. You know, you just plow into this stuff that everyone has looked at and said, somebody needs to do this, I think, and you do it. And now you've done it. So, <laughs> you true. know. That, that, or we're still doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I just want to add that. Flavor. It's, it's quite an amazing journey that you've been on. Just amazing. It is. I, I can't disagree at all. It's been an incredible journey. You know, I feel like life has just sort of pulled me along. Uh, like I've just sort of been grabbing onto this tail that's just, you know, running at full speed attached to some sort of creature. Uh, and I'm just getting sort of pulled and pulled and pulled and pulled and pulled uh, further and further and further into, into, in this case, this rabbit hole. I mean, before that, yeah, it was a, you know, it was a bunch of other things, whether it was, you know, I was instrumental, I think. Uh, you could easily say, and the digital television revolution early on and just all sorts of things like that. So, yeah, I've had a, a pretty interesting track record. I like to, I, you know, it's interesting. I was talking to somebody the other day and they were like, you know, if you look back, it's, it's kind of fascinating because you've just sort of consistently been involved in these projects that affect hundreds of millions or billions of people. Um, and I was thinking to myself, gosh, I sure hope this is another one like that. <laughs> You know, I hope that that wasn't broken, that that chain of events wasn't broken when I shifted my life a dozen years ago and, and headed in this direction. Uh, we'll see. Because I think this is the one thing, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't any of the media stuff. It wasn't any of the computer stuff. It wasn't any of the business stuff. It wasn't any of the investing stuff. It wasn't any of that stuff that I think um, really needed to be as widely accessible as humanly possible. I think this is the stuff that needs to be as widely accessible as humanly possible. And so, you know, we're working on that. I think we're a long way from that at this point, but we're getting up every day and working on it, that's for sure. Well, it's an incredible vision. And I remember the first time that we met, which is now probably five years ago, I can't even count, but me neither. That, that was your vision <laughs> right then. And it just struck sure. me and it was awesome. I think it was somebody needs to have that vision, but your vision was you're sitting around with a bunch of people say, Hey man, come check out my little sangha here and let's get a few people together to do a course. And Jeffrey Martin's going, yeah, but what if we turned on a billion people, you know, what if a billion people woke up? What would that be like? How would that be? What would the economic model for that be? What would the technology model for that be? What would the data from that be? You know what I mean? And not talking about it in some new agey kind of the consciousness of the planet shifting, but more from a kind of Silicon Valley marketing, put it in a spreadsheet kind of thing. No, what would that mean if a billion people made this kind of transition that we say we can measure? So we say we can measure these kind of things like well-being in these different ways. And we all accept that that we can to some extent. And then you're saying, well, what if that shifted this way for a billion people? I mean, that's pretty audacious, but you've <laughs> been true to it. You've been true to it from the very beginning. That said, recap for people, because I think it's really important. If someone did nothing other than the first phase of this work, it would have been a huge contribution, huge contribution. The contribution that everyone sits back and says, well, somebody should do that, somebody should do that, somebody should do that. And you did it in terms of going in to all these communities that say they nurture this enlightenment awakening thing and saying, okay, great. Who are they? Who are the people among your community who have achieved that? And then you went and talked to them. And now how many of those people, this has been years ago, this is at the beginning of your research, but how many of those people have you talk to and systematically try to understand what they're doing, which is phase one. We're not even going to get into phase two yet, but. Yeah, phase one involved, um, in some cases, those long format interviews, those six to 12 hour really digging in interviews, some cases repeating those for people. Uh, so we have some longitudinal research subjects that we still, you know, we'll check in with uh, to this day uh, in an in-depth kind of way. 
Um, and then, you know, a lot of that was um, giving people a lot of the gold standard psychology measures that were out there across a wide range of sub psychology disciplines from well being and positive psychology type stuff to developmental psychology, personality psychology, psychopathology stuff, uh, you name it. Uh, and also physiological measurement. Uh, so lots of brain stuff, um, heart rate, you know, breath, breath rate, breath gases, um, <laughs> kind of like just GSR, um, you know, sort of you name it. Even one thing that we haven't made it to yet, uh, I think even when I talked to you last, I was sort of hoping to make it to there because uh, my friend Deepak Chopra had been harping on me about it at the time. Uh, he's an MD, you know, he's a doctor. And he's still and he's still a doctor. Like people think of him as like this author or whatever else. But at heart, I mean, he's still basically a physician. And so he was like, you know, you need to collect blood on these people and all of that. And we actually have never gotten around to that. I would still like to get around to looking at genetics and looking at genetic changes and looking at blood changes and stuff like that. But you know, I'm sort of more on the neuroscience electrons <laughs> side of the world, not so much the wet lab side of the world. So. So yeah, we did all of that with, uh, it was about 1,200 people who participated in some way in that initial uh, phase of the project, what we call phase one of the research project. So it was a lot of people. It was across every, you know, I think across, as far as I can tell, across every major and most major, majorish, minorish, you know, spiritual and religious traditions, um, but also beyond that. Okay, let's throw some out. Traditional Christian Catholic kind of, did you hit that? Absolutely. You know, we had all the Abrahamic traditions. Someone who considers himself a Christian mystic. Did you have any of those in there? Oh, yeah, for sure. And they were, they were interesting because, you know, the funny thing about the Abrahamic traditions is that the mystics are pushed to the margins. Um, and, you know, like they're never going to get on Christian TV or, you know, whatever, right? Um, they're like com so completely blackballed that it's amazing. Uh, and, I, and I didn't know that until I started interviewing them. It was fascinating to find that out, you know? Yeah, yeah. I'm not trying to, to cut that off. I'm just trying to give people a sense because you say that and I, in some ways you're so comfortable saying it that it doesn't fully capture what I envision it being like for you to set up these long form six hour interviews and now you're talking to a Zen master of a particular branch of Zen Buddhism that's different from this other slightly different one over here and this Korean one and this Vietnamese one. And you're talking to all of them in comparing and contrasting and next is his Sufi master and next is, I mean, give people just a sense of how broad this is. There, so there are two interesting things about that. The first is just how incredibly different they are within the same tradition. Right. And so, like, I remember uh, Theravada Buddhism was, you know, this fascinating one because it turned out that there were a lot of American Theravada Buddhist teachers, uh, which made it really convenient. Right. Because language barriers are brutal when you're trying to get at someone's internal phenomenology. Uh, and so I was like super grateful that we hit this version of Buddhism where there were a lots of uh, lots of people who spoke English as their first language that you could go talk to. Um, but what was very, you know, frustrating about that is that like everyone that you talked to, they all had the same general map. So it was all like, you know, arising and passing away and stream entry and first path and all that stuff. Um, but like you would ask them, okay, well, what is your phenomenological set of characteristics for determining someone has reached first path or whatever, right? Or had stream entry or whatever. Um, and like, they were just so totally different. Like one person's list for arising and passing away matched another person's list for stream entry or whatever else. And you just got this sense like, you know, holy cow, this is kind of nuts. Uh, so there was a lot of difficulty around stuff like that. You forget about cross traditions, <laughs> like within the same tradition, it was, and it makes sense, right? You because you're trying to interpret these texts that are a zillion years old, right? I mean, I, there's this fascinating dissertation done by this lady named Beryl Sater, who, who's, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, because I've never actually heard it pronounced. Uh, but it was from one of the universities in Pennsylvania, and she looked at the new thought movement in America, and she was a period historian, right? And so she just, she was interested in like women's power dynamics within society, and for whatever bizarre reason, she wound up picking the new thought movement as the lens to look at that through for this very hardcore 
period historian style dissertation. Uh, so I ran across that when I was researching the self-help community. Um, prior to researching all of this stuff, I was looking into the self-help community, cause, mostly because I was trying to figure out what I should use myself, you know, what, what actually might work in the self-help community to make me happier, right? And so I ran across this, uh, this dissertation on the New Thought Movement. And now the New Thought Movement occurred like 150 years ago to 100 years ago or so, you know, roughly. Um, and so, and it occurred in America and it occurred in English, right? And so in theory, any of us ought to be able to pick up one of those books and understand what the heck they're saying. And of course, that's the, it's, these are all the books and all the works that form the foundation of, of the modern new thought movement. And a lot of, to some degree, the new age movement and the power of thought movement and the secret and all of it, the, right? They all point back to these people. And I think, you know, if you go back and you read those books, you think to yourself, I totally understand this. Oh, no problem, right? But then you read Beryl's dissertation and you realize that you don't understand anything that you're reading, that it is embedded in a socioeconomic context that you are so completely removed from in 2019. You know, I mean, the late 1800s and how they were thinking about spirit being in these debates that they were having around was spirit infused in matter or was it separate from matter and how did that relate to women's power dynamics in society and how is that language all coded through all of these texts in ways that you and I would never pick up the nuances of so we so we read those books and we're like oh we totally understand these and the reality is we don't understand them at all that's what you learn from reading her dissertation is that you can't read these people's books in english from like 100 years ago and understand their points and understand the nuances of their points. And so I don't think it's surprising that if you sit down with a bunch of Theravada Buddhist teachers in the West and they're deriving their ideas from books that are hundreds of years old, written in a non-English language, that they can't come to some sort of agreement on what the phenomenology should be of their various stages or even what the endpoint should look like of their thing or whatever else, right? Because we can't understand stuff that was written 100 years ago, for crying out loud, in our own language. And it seems like it should be clear as day when we read it, you know, until you read a period scholar's work that just teaches you you don't have any idea what you're actually looking at. Uh, so, I, you know, I think these it's it's things like that that help me to contextualize and, you know, just sort of be cool with it when I sit down with folks, um, because I just sort of understand the situation that they're in, even if they don't necessarily understand the situation that they're in. You know, you go talk to a bunch of new thought people today, and they all think that they totally understand that old new thought literature. You know, they're never going to run across Beryl Sater's dissertation, for God's sakes, right? Uh, or a book. She actually turned it into a book. It's watered down a little bit in the book, but it's still a powerful book. It's called uh, Each Mind a Kingdom or Every Mind a Kingdom or something like that. It's, if you're into that kind of thing, man, that's like an amazing book. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you're into that kind of thing. And I, I, I do. <laughs> and, and and I think that's maybe the the point of this work that you're doing, because you do approach it so much like a social scientist on one hand, and then on the other hand, you're fully in as a subject, as a seeker, and you wear those two hats, and you wear them quite bravely, and I love that about you. The methodology that you were just mentioning, the more I learn about your methodology and some of the presentations you've done and talk about it, the you know, we could talk probably for hours on some of the subtleties of what you've discovered there and how that is important in understanding your work. But I'll just throw out a couple is one, I love these talks that you give and you can see you get pretty passionate about some of these things, but you'll talk about trusting the current experience of that participant in these surveys. So not what they thought 30 years ago when they started their practice, but what they experience and think now. And maybe you can talk to why that's important. And also, like you just mentioned, separating that from what they're supposed to believe, what their tradition teaches, what their texts teach. And you seem to take uh, great pains to really develop a methodology that needed to focus on the data in a particular way in order to get some of the questions that you wanted answered. And I just think that's awesome. Do you want to speak to that at all? Sure, I'm happy to, to speak to that and anything you really want to talk about. It's great. That's right. Uh, so I intentionally did not read anything 
You know, I haven't read any of my subjects books, even though I often would leave their houses with their books, you know, that they would give me as a gift. And so they could hoping that I would read it probably. Um, but I, I didn't read any of them. And the reason that I didn't read any of them is because our project has a very specific philosophy around that in terms of a scientific philosophy, if you will. Um, and that is that what I really want to get at is lived experience, right? And so I don't, I know that I cannot, I know just from sitting down, if it takes six to 12 hours to, to, to get to a point where you think that you probably understand enough of someone's phenomenology um, and they spend the first at least hour or two talking exactly like they would in a book, you know, and that's not enough to really understand their phenomenon, that it takes hours from that point to really come to some sort of meaningful understanding. That just, you know, that tells me that maybe I should read their books before I sit down with them as a starting point, but I don't even do that because it's frozen in time at some point, right? Who knows how many years ago a book was written? I need to know who they are now. I need to understand their phenomenology now. When you say phenomenology, bring that down to a concrete level that any spiritual seeker, quote unquote, listening to this show would understand. I mean, yeah, that's kind of a sciencey term, huh? Um, and if it's in a philosophy term, of course, it's also used in philosophy. It comes out of philosophy, but basically it's all that means is trying to understand someone's internal experience, really just trying to get your arms as much as you possibly can with as much accuracy and as much comprehensiveness around someone's internal way that they are experiencing feeling of oneness, feeling of internal peace, ability to shut down the mind, all these things we hear, and then you're trying to, as a social scientist, say, okay, what does that mean to you? Not what does that mean in some religious context or spiritual context, but... Yeah. How does that show up in your moment-to-moment -moment perception? And I think, you know, it's interesting because one of the things, another one of the fascinating things that we learned very early on was that people are not speaking in metaphor. They are trying to speak to you with as accurate a description in language as they can of their experience, right? And so like one of the things that when they say oneness, like that is an accurate description to them of their, that's as accurate as they can get in language of their experience. It's not some sort of metaphor, right? Or when they say, when I transitioned, it was an instant and it was almost like I woke up from a dream, right? That's the, that's like as good a concrete example as they can as they feel like they can provide you as another human being. They're not trying to provide some metaphor, some loosey goosey thing, some get you in the ballpark type of thing. They're like, okay, searching my entire experience, what is the most concrete example? that I could provide to this person that I'm talking to. So one thing that's interesting about this population of people is that they use their language typically very precisely and very carefully and thought out very carefully. Um, and it's often, it's, it's often an attempt to directly convey their experience. And then the rest of the world sort of sees it different than that, which is sort of funny, right? People often think, oh, waking up for a dream, it's like some metaphor. It's like, oh, now my mind can spin off in a thousand different ways that the person might. No, they mean like when you wake up in the morning and you were having a dream and then suddenly you're not having a dream and you're awake, they're like that exact experience. Like that's what I'm referring to. It's like that's as close as I get. Don't spin it off into some sort of, you know, what did I mean metaphorically about waking up from a dream, taking some poetic license. So it's stuff like that, you know, from a phenomenological standpoint that you wind up discovering. I should say phenomenology, of course, deals with anybody's internal state, not just these people's internal state. It's a, it's a method of inquiry into that. Uh, but yeah, that's the types of things that these people would report, obviously a tremendous sense of peace. You know, that's really, I think, the most fundamental thing. For a long time, I had sort of this list of stuff um, that people would add stuff to and I would cross stuff off of. And I was always looking for the common denominator. Uh, and I think maybe the last time I was on the show, I don't remember if I told this story, but, um, you know, there's this one moment where I was driving from a research interview in Springfield, Illinois, up to another one in Chicago. And the person in Springfield, Illinois, had crossed the very last item that I thought was going to be a commonality off of my list. And it was, I was years into it at that point, right? And it was just like this devastating personal moment for me. I was, I mean, I remember I was like literally crying 
for the first part of that drive because of the impact. And that sounds ridiculous, but I was like, you know, I've spent all these years, I've spent all this money, uh, I've spent, I've put in just my heart and soul into this, and it, and that last guy just basically made it fail. Is, is sort of what it felt like. Um, and then by the end of that drive, by the time I got to, um, it was a little outside of Chicago, sort of in an Indiana suburb. Um, by the time I reached there, I'd sort of recontextualized and I realized that I'd been looking at the trees and had missed the entire forest. And so this list that I had were a, a list of trees and they they caused me to miss this, the, the overall forest, right? And that the thing that was common across all of these people uh, was sort of this fundamental shift in their core psychology away from a sense of discontentment that's common, certainly it was common in me at that time, um, and it's common in most of the mainstream you know, population of humanity around the world. There's just sort of this fundamental sense of discontentment that we all have at the root of our psychology, and it manifests in all kinds of ways. You know, and In the extremes, it's fear and worry and you know, anxiety and stuff like that, but it, no matter who you are, no matter how great your life is, you still have this sense that something's just not quite right. Um, and so, you know, your mind is constantly trying to figure that out in, in a normal, and this is normal, right? This is what psychology would consider normal and healthy. Uh, your mind is just sort of constantly trying to figure this out, you know, and it's, and it, it's like, okay, well, when I have, you know, a Learjet, then I'll finally be, you know, then that, that will finally be quenched, right? And then you get the Learjet, right? And you're like happy for an hour and a half or something. Uh, and it's quenched for an hour and a half or something, right? And then your mind is like, okay, well, the Learjet didn't do it. Um, I must need another child. It's just one more child that I need. Uh, and so let's go off and start in that goal, right? And it's like our, like the normal human mind is just constantly generating all of these goals. Most of, you know, some human minds uh, generate very simple goals that can constantly be achieved. Or maybe, you know, you do get the Learjet if you have a more complicated, uh, <laughs> you have a more uh, sort of aggressive human mind, whatever. But, you know, the more of these things you get, the more you sort of give up on happiness, I think. Uh, it's funny, the most accomplished people, and I know I've just had the privilege to interact with a lot of people who sort of run the world, and they're often the most unhappy people that you can imagine because they've sort of got everything. You know, it's like, what goal have they not achieved in their life by this point? And they've just given up on anything, you know, filling that void or ending that fundamental discontentment. And so for them, it's just, you know, mostly just full steam ahead on the accomplishment track because that's what there is, right? And at least the more things you win on, the more you get the little brief periods of peace or whatever else. Whereas the average person, I think, you know, lots of times they think, you know, they 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 have all of these cultural things that that are that they're told that they should get, maybe like a Learjet, right? And uh, they're never going to get it. And so they just assume, well, I will, could have been happy if I could have had some of those things, right? And so they just sort of accept their lot, you know, to some degree. But the reality is it's just this fundamental heart of human psychology, of traditional human psychology as it seems to have evolved to this point. And what shifts with fundamental well-being is the most amazing thing ever, even though it's the most ordinary thing ever. And, of course, you hear people say phrases like that, and it's very confusing, uh, I think, to the average person. But what the, it's, it's, what's so ordinary about it is there's just like this little shift that happens way at the bottom of your psychology, away from that fundamental sense of discontentment. And towards a sense that everything is really okay. When did you know that? On that drive to Chicago. Okay. So on that, <laughs> drive, on that drive to Chicago, you saw the trees for something more than trees, for a forest. And then you said, wait a minute, I can maybe help people get to the forest. And that launches you on this path of saying, okay, let's create this systematized approach to taking what these people are doing, generalizing, turning into a course, if you will, and then that becomes the focus of what you do next. And you've now done that, collected an amazing amount of data all along. Again, the social scientist in you demands that you measure, 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 because <laughs> no one else, everyone else is talking about this shit and they're not measuring it in a way that becomes really important as the story goes on. So, Bring us more up to date then how that all unfolds. 
So basically the day came when um, phase one ended and phase one had been us talking to people who had only experienced, who had already experienced this uh, sometimes and oftentimes for decades, you know, um, that we had people in the sample that were as little as over just over a year, which was our minimum cutoff for persistence. We had to be in it for just over a year persistently um, all the way up to decades. Uh, but mo yeah, I, I can't remember what our average was. I don't talk about those numbers as, as much anymore, so they're not in my head for for many years. But I mean, I want to say the average persistence was like seven years or twelve years or something like that. And so, um, you know, most of the sample had been in it for a while. Um, and so, what's interesting is that the the day well, the day basically came when post analysis was not enough. You know, you want to know, like, what's actually changing in an individual? Who were these people before? It was very clear to me that they were not able to accurately remember or represent who they were before. You know, one of the things that we know about well-being research in general is that when somebody gets happier and if they have a persistent shift to being happier, they sort of color their entire history with that happiness. You know, it's it's frustrating, I think, for people that that make legit self-help products that actually do help people. Because those people will often get to the end of the process and they're clearly happier, but they'll insist that they're not, <laughs> you know, and it's because they've forgotten how unhappy they were at the beginning of, the, of that, of going to that course or whatever it was, you know, that shifted them. So our, our human system renorms very, very, very rapidly. And that really taught me that there was no way to know who the hell these people were. I mean, they were telling me their stories a little bit about, you know, who they were before. But I just knew that I just couldn't believe any of it, uh, except in broad strokes. And so the day came basically where we wanted A-B data, you know, where we wanted before and after data. And so that's where the Finders Course Protocol came from. Uh, so we started... Um, I had always believed that we would get to this with brain stimulation, which is what we're working on right now. Um, hardcore like we're that's our that's one of our two most major projects right now because the technology is sort of finally there um but back back then five years ago um it was very clear and i would say six seven years ago when we first started thinking about these creating a protocol um it was very clear to me that brain stimulation was not going to get there um you know we we tried everything at the time i was a professor in hong kong for a year and doing research interviews in asia um, and being in Hong Kong, I took advantage of the, you know, reduced regulation and litigious environment and all of that. And we just really went to town. We had a neuroscience lab there at Hong Kong Polytech with a 64 channel EEG system. Um, and so we just really went to town testing brain stem. And it was just clear that none of them were going to reach the regions of interest in the brain that we'd previously identified using other neuroscience work. Um, and so we went back and we went to the questionnaires that we had people fill out and all of the data and just tried to find anything that might help us get to an A-B model. And this is going to sound funny probably to listeners. I think it always sounds funny to people. Um, but we asked a question. I mean, no kidding, right? We asked a question that was, so what worked for you? <laughs> right? And people answered that question, right? But I didn't actually believe that we would get accurate answers on that question. And the reason for that is because one thing that I learned about spiritual teachers by the time we were doing serious data analysis was that they really never taught or talked, they didn't seem to, they didn't seem to teach or talk much about the thing that actually worked for them. Um, and so that's, I know a little bit of a strange puzzle because you would think that like if, you know, my, when it, one of my most, my initial and most significant transition was from something called headless way which people can go look up. Um, so my own personal shift of consciousness came from something called Headless Way. Right? And Headless Way sounds ridiculous. You know, it's basically like you pointing at your face, you know, asking yourself, do I have a head? I mean, it, it sounds like the most ludicrous method ever, right? And so when I was interviewing people, you know, I would be like, you know, well, tell me about your background. They, oh, you know, 25 years of, you know, this type of Tibetan meditation and this other Buddhist meditation before that and whatever. And I'm like, oh, is that what transitioned you? And they're like, they're like oh. and you would see it like it almost like a deer in the headlights, right? Because they didn't want to say it was headless way. They didn't want to say that they spent 30 years sitting on a cushion, you know, torturing themselves. And then they pointed at their face one day and that was the thing that transitioned them to fundamental well-being, right? And so and so I, I just didn't I I never bothered to look at the answers on that question because I just didn't think that they would be accurate, but they actually did turn out to be accurate. So that was a bad mistake on my part. 
Um, and we were able to sort those into a handful of categories. You could make it five or six categories, depending upon how you want to think about these methods. Um, and then we just basically started systematically trying them out. And it turned out that they worked for a large percentage of people. Uh, so that became the protocol. Um, and that was a game changer for us because then you could invest money um, in research. You know, up to that point, I mean, you can't just say, you can't just go into a Buddhist community and pick out who's going to transition next week so that you can, you know, measure them before and afterward. So it would have been an expensive and almost an impossible proposition. But having that protocol uh, made that possible. And so um, then we had a problem with the protocol of people not doing it because it's long, it's four months, it's you know at least an hour and a half to two and a half hours a day. I mean, like you've gotta really want this. So when you say protocol, let's make sure we understand. There's something out there called the finders course. You run the finders course, an online course that is a, con a combination of uh, video and small group sessions with different exercises you're doing, protocols you're following both inside the group and individually including yeah. meditation, including positive psychology, including all these things. It's broken off. It's a 12 week kind of program, right? I think 17 weeks beginning to end now. Okay. 17 weeks. There's aftercare at the end of it. There's also a lot of data gathering. So you're going to have to fill out a bunch of forms at the beginning that is going to kind of like you just said, pinpoint where you're at so you can't fudge the numbers and say, ah, I was happy in it. it you no, know, back here when you first did it, we ran all the numbers on all these standardized well-being measures and this is where you're at and this is where you're at now. And that might not matter to you, but it matters to us because again, we're also looking at what does this mean for the planet? What does this mean for a billion people? And that's always been a goal of this. And, and that is, at the time, this was just a research project. Um, but now, uh, I just, now it's really more of just a product that we're deciding to put out there. You know, we reached a point not long ago where um, I would say, I mean, it's been within recent months of doing this interview where we just don't need any more data like that you know i mean we've got five years of data you know like another cohort of data added to that is not going to make it more significant it's not going to increase the power or the statistical power or effect sizes or anything like that i mean we just we basically just don't need any more uh and so we've cut way back on the data collection part of it and then the question for us was do we kill it you know or do we continue to make it available frankly. And we really thought about it. Um, and we decided, you know, this is as far as I know, the most effective thing that's out there. So we probably shouldn't kill it. Um, on the other hand, we're, our research has moved on to other areas. Um, and so, so anyway, we're keeping it out there and we're in the process of transitioning it into literally just being an online course, essentially, which is what we, which is what it looked like from the very beginning, but we never thought of it that way. Uh, and the reason it looked like that was because the way we got people to ultimately go all the way through it was to make it into what looked like a class instead of a psychology experiment, right? I mean, everybody that's ever taught Psych 101 knows that even when you're, even for extra credit, even for part of their grade, you know, you still can't get people <laughs> to do like minimal amounts of experiments over the course of, you know, a semester. Um, they still will drop out of your experiments in significant numbers. It's annoying as that is. And of course, most psychology research is when you read most psychology papers, they're basically done on undergraduates uh, that are in a psych 101 class or something like that. I mean, they never say that. They very rarely admit to that. But the vast majority of human psychology results are psych 101 students or whatever, who are basically forced to do it for part of their grade or to get extra credit, depending upon the institution's policy in the part of the world and what the professor can get away with for that. From our perspective, um, what we decided to do, we experiment with a lot of things. Um, and then we just decided to make it we made it look like a class, basically. We made it look like a public class. So we were always completely straightforward with people that it was research. They always had to sign consent documents for the you know, IRBs and uh, stuff like that. Uh, and obviously, they had to tolerate endless hours of data collection uh, in order to take the class and all of that. Um, so I don't think anybody had any illusions about whether or not it was actually, whether or not they were actually participating, at a, whether or not they were you know, being studied, right? The headline that we're going to find in the finders 
and anyone who comes across your research, the headline is quite dramatic and astounding, but it is what the data is. This is phenomenally successful in transitioning people to a new state of well-being that isn't comparable to anything we've seen in the past. I mean, how far can we go with that? How far do you feel comfortable going with that? Yeah, you know, people can go to nonsimbach.org and look on the publications page, and they can see um, a talk that I gave to a division of the American Anthropological Association as one of their keynotes that has like, it's like an hour or two hour talk or something, and it just has it all in there. And so that really probably is the last tranche or set of data that we will spend a huge amount of time analyzing and thinking through. And so that I, I would consider that our up-to-date data. And so that was a 70% transition rate, essentially, to these types of things. And people can look and they can see the, I mean, the, you know, when psychologists look at the, those numbers, they look impossible. Uh, I mean, you shouldn't be able to have like a 50% drop in neuroticism. That's a, you know, your personality traits for, just to pick one example of one piece, one tiny piece of data, your personality traits are supposed to be relatively stable. You know, you shouldn't be able to take a four month program and have a 50% drop in neuroticism or whatever, right? Highlight a couple other data points, stress, happiness. Yeah, stress, happiness. Uh, there's a Jeez, I, I mean, uh, I'm not thinking too much about these numbers anymore, but I think there's like a 40% drop on depression measures on the Center for Epidemiological Studies uh, depression measure, which is one of the main depression measures. All the measures were like major measures, you know. Huge shifts in the mysticism type measures, of course, as one would expect. Uh, I, you know, for me personally, one of the most, I, was, I, I would give these presentations every year at, at the interested scientific conferences and stuff, right? They would just invite us to present every year because who the heck else is doing this, right? And I remember there, was, there, there were always like a few people that I was really waiting to see when I tipped them over with data, you know, like the, just the diehard skeptics in the room, right? Um, the people who really just did not want to believe our findings in many cases because they were Buddhist themselves, even though they were also neuroscientists or whatever else. And, and so they just had, they had fundamental philosophical ideological beliefs that made them diametrically opposed to our data. And I remember, um, a couple of years ago, I think I was presenting, there was one guy that was left, right? And I love him to death. I won't say who it is, but I love him to death. He's a friend of mine. I have enormous respect for his work. He's he's one of, I think, the most important people in the neuroscience of this space. Um, but, you know, as close, as, 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 as much as we like each other and as much as we respect each other, you know, he was a hardened critic of our work for a very long time. And I remember I was in this one presentation and I was just sort of, we finally had enough pieces of, of data between well-being, between the well-being and depression stuff. Um, and between the personality measure stuff, like the neuroticism drop. And I could tell that like the one piece of evidence that probably tipped it for him was the meaning measures. Um, so we collected data on personal meaning. And there is this one measure that, that looks at meaning in two different ways. These people are very accurately, I mean, it's impressive work, right, that they've gotten to this with a measure. And so they look at meaning as what they call presence and search. And search really is seeking. And it's like a negative form of meaning making, but they've found a way to measure it. And presence is essentially like just being at peace with things. And so it's like the, the form of meaning you want, right? It's like the positive form of meaning that's so elusive for humanity. And we had just really clear, you know, highly statistically significant results that basically showed that in this population of people reporting fundamental well being, that you have this, the search, the seeking portion of meaning, if you will, you know, really significantly dropping and the presence form of meaning really significantly increasing. And, I'd not, and I don't think I'd ever presented that particular data before, uh, but I could tell it was that piece and also a piece of data on disassociation and depersonalization. It was just I, like I could just see his face change. You know, and after that, it was there wasn't any more criticism. It was like, you know, that, OK, you've you've got the puzzle. Like, I'm convinced, like, you've got the puzzle. Those are all of the puzzle pieces that I would need to see. That's really what we've done. Um, but so anyway, now we're going to keep we've, we're keeping the course out there. The course is it's now now it is a course. Actually, it's not we're still collecting data. 
because we figure why not, but we're collecting a lot less of it than we've ever collected in the past. And we think, you know, maybe some PhD student will come along someday, want to dig into a bunch of it or um, whatever else. There's no reason to not be collecting the data um, because at the same time, people can also sort of see their own change. We use um, UPenn's online psychology measures thing for a chunk of it. And so they can see their own before and after results on all of these leading measures. That's basically now actually a class. And where our research has moved on to is very different than that. Let's talk about that because I've spent a good deal of time rehashing stuff that we already talked about. But I think it's, it's important because if you jump into the middle of this and just talk about what's going forward, it, it's such an amazing story. It's so unique what you've done. We just can't stress that enough. Whether people like it or don't like it, whether you're that grumpy Buddhist neuroscience <laughs> type who's sitting there going, this isn't it, or whether you're a spiritual seeker who's so attached to your own tradition that you feel like this guy is going to take the secret sauce out of what you already know. There's all sorts of reasons to be a hater on this stuff, and I'm sure you've encountered sure. all of them. But here's what happened. I, I sent you this email. I said, hey, here's some things we would like to talk about. You just boomed like a laser zeroed in and said, hey, I think we've talked about a lot of that stuff already. Here's some <laughs> of the stuff that I think is going on right now that would be interesting to your listeners. So the data that you have mm -hmm. allows you to scrutinize spiritual claims in a way that wasn't possible before. It's a knife. <laughs> and in your hand, you are not unwilling to wield that knife sometimes at some folks who you think deserve it. So here's what you said. We basically feel like those systems, that is religious systems like Buddhism and others, have failed for a millennia, failed humanity essentially, except as some sort of minimal cultural carrier. It's not difficult to transition people. This is what you're saying is, hey, I've been doing this, guys. We've run it. We've collected the data. We know how to do it. It's not difficult to transition people, which everyone thinks is impossible. So the fact that these systems aren't routinely doing it at scale is an indication that they're best left in the past. I mean, that's going to piss a lot of people off right there. I mean, I don't care if you're in, that, in the audience seeing your data or not. Yeah. Process that. Yeah, you know, we have a scientific framework, not a religious framework, right? I'm not a religious scholar, though obviously we've had a lot of religious scholars on the project and associated with the project and whatnot because they're interested in meeting people who are relate to the things that, you know, they studied or whatever. But to us, it's it's it, it really is sort of becoming that clear. You know, we have had such a massive amount of hostility uh, directed at us in recent years as we've conducted these experiments and as we've been sort of more routinely transitioning people from these various systems. And we've done, I feel like, a lot of outreach. Um, you know, we've allowed a lot of people from those systems to use our programs for free or even subsidizing them in other ways or even adapting things in other ways and allowing them to run them in person because they're more comfortable running things in person. Then not even making them use our online format and protocol. And, you know, I feel like we've done as much as we can do to really sort of reach out. And yet there's still just such hostility that comes from those folks. And, you know, I, I mean, how happy can you really be if you're that hostile? If you're really experiencing this stuff, it's hard to be that hostile. You know, you're more, I, I would like to think you're a little more like us where you're asking yourself, what can I do to help this person? And that's really significant. I mean, I think the outreach part is, is really significant for people to hear people who are critics. It's like, you know, oh, this guy's just in it for the money or he's heavy handed or he's this and that. Whatever you want to say about the way he's conducted his research. And I think at this point, it's just beyond question. Like he just said, it's research. Look at the outreach. Look at when people come to him and say, hey, I really think this could benefit this group if we did it in this way. And I think the general vibe that I get back and I did from the beginning when I heard you was like, okay, great. Well, you know, here's how you might go about doing that. Good luck to you. You know, I mean, how can you criticize that? But here's the other thing you said in the email to me. Spiritual salesmanship around fundamental well-being has just been completely bogus. Yeah, I think so. I think we got to process that a lot. I think we got to really break that apart because we have to understand what that 
resistance, what that jealousy is about. It's not the whole story. The big story is what you're talking about. 70% of people can feel better about themselves and be along their path, whatever that path takes them, they can help. But there is a built in resistance to the system that I like that you bring out your sword and you want to slash away at spiritual salesmanship around this idea of fundamental well-being has been completely bogus. In what ways has it been bogus? In this area, you know, when I first started trying to research this area, it was so hard. And the reason it was so hard was because the general view of it within the psychology establishment was that the claims are so anti-materialist. Right. And so it's all just get enlightened. And then basically you're, the path ahead of you is just paved with gold. It's all just perfect synchronistic unfoldment. I mean, you know, you, if you're hungry and you want an orange, you just hold out your hand and visualize an orange and the orange shows up in your hand, you know. But, but if you're really advanced, you just infuse the orangeness into your system and you don't even bother with that. Or, I mean, these are actual things, you know, that we heard. And so I think that traditionally, one thing that's been interesting about the people who have pursued fundamental well-being, which is a tiny percent of the population, a tiny, tiny, tiny percent of the population, probably in the hundreds of thousands uh, of English speakers, you know, native English, Western English speakers. So that's a very small group of people, right, who have really, really pursued it. Uh, I'm not talking about people who don't want their ego to be happier or whatever, but who have really pursued this fundamental well-being shift. It's a relatively small number of people, and it was a, and by and large, it was a mostly unhappy group of people. And so that's colored a lot of things relating to this in the West and from a public standpoint. Well, there's also, let me play, play this out and see what you think. You go back to your story, right? And, which is everybody's story. I'm unhappy. I'm not as happy as I think I should be. I'm not as happy as those TV ads tell me I can be. I want to be happier. So you have somewhat of a spiritual bent and maybe you have like a anti-religious bent like a lot of us do when we say, somebody says meditation. You go, oh, okay, meditation, what should I do? And you go online, you meditation. I know the Zen people meditate. So you find the local Zen people that'll let you come in and sit down and you start meditating or you start taking a, a yoga class. And there's all this stuff that they're saying around all these things. So you wind up following it in some cases for years and years, and you wind up scratching your head and go, you know what I really wanted was I wanted to feel better. I wanted to feel right. more a sense of well-being. Am I really getting there with that? I, I think that's what I read out of this aspect of spiritual salesmanship that I think you're directly debunking, which is to say, if this is what you say you want, we can measure it in these ways then why wouldn't we want to, as directly as possible, try and achieve that? What's wrong with that? I agree. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say, you know, one of the problems with it, where the spiritual salesmanship, I think, comes in is in the sales process. I talk about what fundamental well-being is. It's pretty much the opposite of the normal sense of self, right? And so if you're in your normal sense of self, and I'm trying to convince you that fundamental well-being is where it's at, it sounds thoroughly undesirable to your normal sense of self, right? That's so profound, but let's break that down a little bit. Yeah, I, let's really get into this and let's really talk about all of this because I think this is, it's important. And for a long time, you know, we've, we've avoided these types of conversations, I think, out of, I don't know, politeness. Uh, but it didn't get us anywhere. It just kept getting us attacked more and more and more and more and more and more and more. And now I think we're sort of done with avoiding these types of conversations and, you know, whatever else. Because it just, it, to us, it just seems so clear, having cut a swath across so many different communities, right? The patterns are just, they're all over the place. And they're not limited to one particular group or another particular group or whatever else, right? So let me go back and let me, let me, let me talk a little bit, if I could, just real quick about what you said a minute ago, right? We don't, it's not that we don't see a value in religion and spiritual systems. We absolutely do, right? We use a lot of their methods that they've come up with for hundreds of years. They've been a very important cultural carrier across millennia, across the rise and fall of empires that tend to wipe out knowledge 
knowledge and histories and whatever else. They have they have been like the cultural carrier thread through that. A culture carrier of what? Uh, obviously, a cultural carrier of the knowledge that this that fundamental well being exists and that you can reach it, and of having clues for how to reach it. And I think that's very valuable. And if you think back to if you, you know, if you think back to who knows how many hundreds of years ago, like those little Tibetan tinksha uh, symbol things were created, right? But that's an amazing technology. You know, this, th if you measure those things, most of them, the real ones, are like a 10 hertz binaural beat designed to be held up to each side of your head. I mean, like somebody hundreds of years ago created a genius piece of consciousness altering technology there, right? A lot of these things that they've come up with were brilliant and cutting edge in their day. The problem for us is that it's, you know, when we look at it critically, is that at some point that just seems to have stopped, right? I mean, for the last 150 years, there's been a, sci a major scientific rev revolution going on, right? Where have been, where are the modern tincture bells coming out of these traditions? Um, that was just bleeding edge science and engineering at some point, however many hundreds or thousands, I don't know the history on those tincture bell things, right? Or those symbol things. Um, they were at one point on the absolute bleeding edge of science and technology of human consciousness. But, at, at, but it's, I think it's undeniable that at some point that stopped. Right, and I'm living evidence of that. I should never have had to spend the last 12 years of my life doing this, right? I mean, for hundreds of years, those traditions could have been keeping up with science as it was evolving. I mean, the EEG was invented over 100 years ago at this point, right? I mean, anyone from any of these traditions could have been like, hey, let's see what's coming out of our meditation teacher's head and see if we can start advancing this, right? Um, but where was that per se, right? So I, it's, not that, it's not that throughout all of human history there was no value. I think there was tremendous value, but it's almost like that, that value proposition stopped advancing at a certain point and human culture kept moving on and now there's this tremendous out of phaseness you know one of the things that we pick up on in um, in our participant research especially people who come in to uh, the, the finders course when it was an experiment is it's very clear that you know they've been involved in Buddhism not because they love the the lore of Buddhism but because they think that that's where some method might exist that might increase their well-being right it's almost like most of them are trying to avoid the dogma of Buddhism but get the method that they think might actually you know assist them in some way I remember I was sitting I was researching this uh, famous Tibetan guy one time and I was sitting in this small group um, of kind of like elite people. Um, that he was teaching, uh, waiting for him to get done so that I could, you know, talk to him afterward. I had an appointment scheduled with him afterward, and I, he's like, come early, I'm going to give this teaching. And so I came early and he gives this teaching. And he's talking about the Buddha coming out of the side of his mother, being born out of the side of his mother, and all of this various dogma, to this room full of wealthy Westerners, frankly, who, who were like, can we please get to the meditation park, Right. Like the last thing they wanted to hear was the Buddha coming out of the side of his mother or whatever else, right? And but they're having to sort of suffer through that in some sense to get to the thing that they actually showed up for, which was meditation that they were hoping would relieve some of their psychological suffering. And so, so it's not that I think that there's that there's a, a, a wholesale lack of a value proposition there, but you know, let's face it, we're not all in PNSE for some reason. We're not all in fundamental well-being. For some reason, and and these are the systems that have taken a crack at it for hundreds and thousands of years, at this point. And so I don't think that you can say, "Wow, look at the success that that has been." And you certainly can't say, "Wow, look at how they've kept up with their technologies and how they have evolved into modern eras." You know, no one sitting in that room of wealthy people wanted to look like wanted their life to be like that Tibetan teacher's life. Right? They wanted this integrated into their own life. They wanted a modern, secular, Western version of this that solved their fundamental core well-being problems and then you know, allowed them to live a modern Western lifestyle. Not having to renounce meat or sex or money or, you know, dress in some certain way or, you know, any of those other things like they want to go to work tomorrow 
or do their investing tomorrow or whatever it is that particular group did. And so that's where that's that's what I was trying to convey, basically, sort of, you know, that's where we come out. There's tr we think there's tremendous value in a lot of these things. And, and to, this, to the degree that they help, who they help, I think that's fantastic. But we really feel like there's this whole other approach that is more suited to modernity. And then I, the other thing that I would add to that would be on the flip side of the spiritual salesmanship thing, you know, it is incredibly tempting to give in to spiritual salesmanship. Um, it is incredibly tempting to say, you know what, your sense, your, your synchronicity will increase to the point where life will be effortless for you, Alex. This is the thing that you've been looking at. Life is such a struggle for you. I know it's been such a struggle for you up to this point in your life, but you can have this deep inner peace and just this perfect unfolding where everything is synchronistic. And like this life is waiting for you, Alex, that you just can't, man, you just can't imagine it. You've just got to have this shift, right? And so that's what I mean when I'm talking about spiritual salesmanship, right? And there are absolutely you know, types of fundamental well-being where it feels like every moment is 100% synchronistic. There's no doubt about that, right? That is not a lie. If I'm in that place to say to you, it can feel like life is 100% synchronistic, right? However, I know people who are in that place that are of 100% synchronistic who have lost their houses to foreclosure, who have gone to prison, who have had what outwardly to the rest of us would seem like highly negative life events. And so for them to also say the other part of that statement, which is, you know, life will just unfold magically for you. There will be no more struggle. Now, what they're meaning internally is, oh, I lost my house. Well, big deal. Who cares? I'll just go sleep under a bridge. No big struggle, right? But what you hear as a normal human being is not, oh, I won't, I, I'll, I may lose my house, but I won't care if I'm sleeping under a bridge for the rest of my life, um, that will still feel, you know, sort of fine and synchronistic and, you know, whatever else. Um, and so there's the, and they, and they know when they're communicating these things, how you're hearing it. They know that you're not understanding it in their, from their own perspective, right? But they're kind of justifying it from their own perspective. And they're sort of justifying what they're saying from their own perspective because they're not really lying to you right? That is how they're experiencing the world. It is deep inner peace. It is 100% synchronicity. It is an imperturbable, you know, from where they're at. It does feel like everything is happening exactly as it should, no matter how adverse the events that are happening to them or whatever else, right? But they're not saying to you, oh, hey, by the way, I lost my house last week. Um, you know, they're leaving out facts like that, and they're letting sort of your brain fill in this sort of magical existence that you can have if only you'll transition to fundamental well-being. And so in, in, in that sense, you know, we, we kind of take issue from that's where I talk about. That's what I mean when I say sort of spiritual salesmanship. It's not necessarily pure dishonesty from their own internal phenomenological experience. But on the other hand, they're not really giving you the whole picture either uh, in terms of their own struggles and their, what, you would, what the normal person would consider their own life struggle, right? They're giving you the part where it's like, man, I want that. You know, your ego's like, yeah, I'm tired of struggling. Life sucks. I want that. But they're not telling you that, that, that what your ego calls struggle will, you know, still exist for you basically on the other side. Those life events that your ego refers to as struggling in the world are not going to probably go away for you. There's challenges with that too, though. I mean, and, and I think you understand that. But as soon as you get into the prescriptive model and away from the descriptive model of the social scientist, you're layering your own values on there, which, sure. you know, we're pointing at those people and saying their values. But I don't want to bury the lead because the lead story. No, that's no question. That's true. The lead story is so important, which is as a social scientist, as you cut away everything that isn't, then opens up the possibility for everyone to determine what is, what is for them, what part of their tradition they want to take, what part they don't need, how much of it is social engineering, how much of it is someone trying to get in their pocket for their cult, for their religion, for their build a church down in the corner, how much of it is some kind of larger scale psyop to control and manipulate all that stuff. As the social scientist, you cut, 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 cut. And you say, ah, right. I now have the essence. 
you can go with it from there. But I certainly understand, and we can all appreciate, a little bit of rage that comes up in interacting with these communities who are so insistent that their layering is the only layering that one can do on that. But I guess this, is there anything more we want to say about what you've labeled as integration, how we, how we yeah, integrate for sure. this awakening that comes through the finders course comes through this experience and then integrating it into our life. Yeah, absolutely. You could say a lot about it. Uh, and let me let me add that, you know, there are, especially I think in the non-dual community, the modern sort of contemporary non-dual community, and I, if you think about someone like um, Scott Killaby, Scott has publicly identified himself as having participated in our research to people. Um, and so I can say that he's participated in our research. I'm not going to give out, you know, data about him or whatever. Uh, but just to say that I, you know, I have sat down with him at length, had very meaningful conversations with him, et cetera, et cetera. He's a great example, I think, of someone who is doing their level best to avoid those sort of dilemmas, those Western moral dilemmas, if you will, from a spiritual salesmanship standpoint, right? I remember reading this post from him. There was this thing going around about a guy named Fred Davis, um, who is, I think, a very effective, actually, non-dual teacher. Uh, and I don't remember, actually, what the scandal was. There was some sort of scandal going around, and I remember thinking that doesn't really seem like a big deal. Uh, it's a big deal, I think, if you have a certain belief system around how all of these people are supposed to be perfect beings that, you know, don't spit their food out when they're talking to you over dinner and stuff like that, right? Uh, but if you don't have a view of them as being perfect beings, you're like, what's the big deal there? <laughs> you know. So Scott wrote this post where he was like, essentially like, well, here's all the shit that's been wrong in my life. Uh, I mean, it was just this amazing, transparent post. And I think the non, you know, some of these non-dual teachers in the non-dual portion of this overall spiritual religious sort of world um, have in recent years really tried hard to be straightforward about this. And, and I've been very, very impressed by that because that's a, that's a brave thing to do for their businesses. If you're in competition with a guy across the road in the non-dual space, and that guy's talking about life being perfect for you in their version of non-duality after you transition. And then you read a post from someone like Scott who's talking about his own personal struggles and his own difficulties in his own life. And is just being brutally honest and just laying it all bare. Because, of course, we all have them. When you're like us and you sort of know all these people and know that they all have them. Some are just choosing to talk about them and some aren't choosing to talk about them. That is just so amazing to me and so brave. And it is a trend. And so it's a, it is a coming trend. There is a pushback in at least a, a section of that non-dual community here in America that is like really just trying to bare knuckle it. Uh, and I think we really need to give acknowledgement to that. So from our standpoint for integration, you know, what we've been trying to convince teachers of for a long time now is that they don't need, they shouldn't, I don't think that they should really feel in competition for seekers. They're, they really have, you know, it's like there's not that many seekers, really sincere seekers out there. And so if you're trying to earn a living doing this, that can be challenging. And it's like, oh my gosh, I don't want to lose my seeker to that other guy because there's, you know, how am I going to replace that seeker? It took me forever to get that guy. Um, and so there's a lot of sort of this business stuff that goes on behind the scenes in these worlds as well, right? One of the things that I think you're going to see happening if we're successful, especially, you're going to see it happening, is you're going to see a transition for these people and how they think about themselves. Because to my mind, I think a spiritual teacher is not necessarily always the greatest help in transitioning someone, but they are an immense help on the other side of transitioning. Because there aren't that many people in the world who have been through the life integration process of this stuff, right? I mean, on the other side of this, the reason that you the reason that you don't see more genuine advertising around this stuff is that for instance, it's very common for a year to two years after the transition to have a significant drop in motivation. So there's a fundamental shift that occurs in your goal attainment. You know, your goals have basically been driven by neurotic impulses in you, which drop away, right? And when you're when your neuroticism drops and your goals fall away, guess what falls away with that? Motivation, right? And it's like your brain has to go through a period of time where it's unraveling your former motivation system and rebuilding a new motivation system. And everybody wants to hear, I'm going to get enlightened and I'm going to be 10 times more effective in my job, right? Nobody wants to hear, 
I'm going to have issues with motivation. Or nobody wants to hear, I'm going to transition to this entirely other way of seeing the world. And a consequence of that is that I'm going to feel sort of like an alien now living in normal reality because 99.5% of the rest of the population is experiencing life in this highly neurotic way. Including my wife, my boyfriend, my girlfriend, my husband, my, my kids. My wife, my boyfriend, my kids, my whoever, right? All, every friend I have, everybody at work, literally my entire world. And, you know, and I used to experience that. I just experienced it yesterday. I still have a, you know, fairly decent memory of what that experience was like. But, you know, I don't want to sit around and talk to these people about their neurotic stories anymore. My life is no longer a game of me sitting there validating your neurotic story so that you'll sit there validating my neurotic story, right? Like that to me is like just a reduction in my peace, not a leveling up of my peace. And so I'm just not interested in doing that anymore, you know? I'm not that interested in reading the novels that I read for years or watching the TV series with you because they're all these story driven neurotic sort of things, you know, that are designed to hit me in certain ways and make me feel certain ways or whatever. Like I'm at peace. I don't need that stuff anymore. Right. Uh, and so there's like these, these, these significant life changes that occur. And who's talking about that? Right. Because like, you, I mean, how many people are going to sign up for your program to some degree? And we take a huge risk on this, right? Because we have all kinds of research out there that basically says, this is what it's like on the other side of this. And so, you know, you like you sign up with us, you sort of know what you're getting. I understand the dilemma. And I've seen, I even know the histories of a lot of these organizations. And I know at what point different advertising things were incorporated or at what point methods were shifted to go from being an hour to being 20 minutes so that you could pull more people in, even though you know it's not as effective as the hour. Nonetheless, you can't grow to a certain size if you don't have it at, at 10 or 20 minutes or one minute or five minutes or you know, whatever it is. So I, I get the business decisions that were behind all of these things, even though to the adherents, it's all nothing is business. It's none. It's, it's all nothing to do with business. But of course, these were all strategic marketing and business decisions that have been made. As I was listening to this over the years, I was thinking to myself, how are we going to avoid this? I mean, I spent the mid 90s sort of running a chunk of the the heart of one of the world's at, at the time, the world's first and most significant advertising conglomerate. Right. I've got a background in advertising and marketing. And I was listening to these people's business descriptions you know, and how they'd evolved them over time and the decision that they'd come to and how they'd morally justified them inside their own minds and all of that. And the whole time that I'm listening to that, I'm noting it for research, but I'm also sort of thinking to myself, holy crap, you know, how can you get around that? And I think there isn't a good way to get around it. You sort of have to, you have to make a decision to go one way or the other. It has to either be, I'm going to give you the life as a synchronistic golden path. You know, everything is going to be perfect for you and not tell you that I just lost my house. I'm going to sort of leave that part out of it. But I'm being honest about how this moment is feeling for me. Or you have to be like, you know, you're going to have major life changes here. You're going to your life as a finder is going to be to some degree a moment, depending upon where you land, the degree of agency you still have, all of that. I mean, let's leave all that aside for the moment in terms of debating the nuances of fundamental well-being and the different types of it and all that. And let me just say generically, you know, to some degree, your life is going to be a moment-to-moment -moment decision of how much of that deep internal peace are you willing to erode for personal effectiveness in the world. Because the entire rest of the world is sort of anti that internal personal effectiveness. And so integration at its heart for PNSE comes down to psychological deconditioning and undoing all of those old programming patterns because you don't have the sense of self reinforcing them anymore and optimum ways to do that. And you know that's a lot of our research and a lot of our work right now. And so that's all really important. But the fundamental question of living in the world comes down to how much of my peace am I going to erode in order to have X degree of effectiveness. And so there's a, there's, for instance, a high divorce rate among people, not advertised, right? Like who's putting that in their, you know, web pages, right? Hey, come and get enlightened and you'll probably get divorced. Uh, but there's a high degree of divorce rate among this, right? Because you wake up and you have, you know, this spouse that is still there. They're not awake. They're not happy that you're happy all the time. I mean, as much as we would like to think that they have our best interest at heart in every moment of our life, you know, the reality is like now you're sort of the shining example of what their system has been yearning for since they were a little kid or what. Anyone in a relationship understands that there's dynamics and when those dynamics yeah. 
change, everything changes. You know, let, let me just... Anyway. No, I, I just want to take it in a slightly different direction because you, you said yeah. something, I think, that might be very, uh, I was going to say profound, but it's not just pr profound. I think it's probably true from a guy who is a bit of a futurist and has kind of created this future. I know you're very much into tech, not for the sake of tech, but as a tool for maybe facilitating this transition. And I wonder if that's also informing this future you see, because if tech does begin to play more of a role in this, then we have technology that's facilitating change. It lessens the need for someone in the physical form doing that on a one-on-one -on -one or even one-on-10 -on basis. But it would then maybe bring the high touch aspect back into the integration like you're talking about, because it would just seem to me that potentially that's what you also envision or am I wrong there? Yeah, I do think that um, it's difficult for me knowing what I know now. Of course, we can all be wrong, you know, in the next 10 seconds, right? But it's difficult for me to, to, to think knowing what I know now that this is going to be translatable to 6 billion people in a non-technological form. We've analyzed the data from the finder's course every way we possibly can. And one key thing about the finder's course that failed, um, I think our biggest failure to date, is that we have not been able to find a way to match people up with a method that works for them. That's what the entire course tries to do, right? You basically go week to week to week and you try different stuff that is all the best stuff that rose to the top of our research. Uh, and you do it in a certain systematic way that increases its effectiveness and all that. But the reality is, Fundamentally, what we were trying to get at with that experiment and what we were trying to do with that experiment was not really refine our understanding of fundamental well-being, which we did, but it was to figure out, can I give you a pencil and paper questionnaire or interview you for a couple of minutes or something and then say, you know what, Alex, headless way is your thing, man. That's what you need. That's the thing. You know, just do it Try for this week first. and you'll be, you'll be awake by Friday. You know, you'll transition to fundamental well-being by Friday. And it'll all be good. Come back to us and, you know, I'll give you some integration stuff. Uh, just let me, I mean, maybe it'll happen Wednesday, Thursday, you know, whenever it happens, just, you know, just ping me and I'll shoot you some integration stuff over, right? So we never, we have not yet reached a point with our data analysis that has allowed us to do that. You still have to take the whole program and who the heck, you know, in a developing country can spend two to three hours a day. In the West, it's more doable for a certain class of people, at least. To be able to do that, like it can have the impact that it has among the people that it's sort of a possible fit for, but it is not going to scale to a billion people. It's not going to scale to 500 million people. And because we, we fundamentally were not able to be successful at creating that matching algorithm, um, which could potentially allow a more traditional thing like just a psychological intervention like a meditation or a cognitive science hack or a positive psychology exercise or whatever it is to scale you know it's i think that in my mind it's going to come down to technology uh, unless you know i mean you never know we have machine learning people and ai people that are volunteering their time on the project looking at that data deep mining it something might come out of that that just humans couldn't see with standard statistical methods and analyses i won't rule that out and so you know i could you know we could get off the phone i could check my email and be like, oh, hey, Alex, uh, I got to revise that statement, right? It could happen at any time, but I'm not, but I'm assuming it but That won't. still wouldn't shut down the tech path either. I mean, the tech path would still have to continue to go forward as well. I think the point you made about the sound frequency of the Tibetan symbols is, I think, undeniable at some level. So it, it does seem like the technology has to go forward. That has to be part of this mission. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, unless something, unless something dramatically changes right now, we're, uh, we're basically pinning our hopes on really sort of a combination of transcranial light stimulation, meaning light that goes through the skull and transcranial ultrasound stimulation. And the problem for the transcranial ultrasound stimulation is that once it's out of the lab, there's going to be, you know, ridiculously long and expensive FDA processes and, you know, stuff like that in order to make it more widely available um, to people. Um, and so it's, it's got a lot of regulatory hurdles for the West associated with it. I think that's less true. I think it can probably affect a lot of populations in places like India or China or whatever before that. 
Um, and probably those populations will be the ones that benefit um, initially. Uh, and I think that's fine because there's billions of people there. We're not really sort of country centric per se in any way. You know, we're sort of just like getting this to as many people as we can possibly get it to uh, oriented. So, but the transcranial ultrasound stuff, you know, the, our chief scientist here literally came to me a couple of mornings ago and was like, you know, I think we've reached the point where we have, where we can say that we're really reliably getting people into location one of fundamental well-being, you know, with this technology. Now it's still extremely expensive. Um, you know, you're talking about really sort of all, I mean, our budget is in the millions a year for that project. Uh, and so if you were to divide out, you know, the amount of stimulation time that's possible each day by millions of dollars, you know, you get to a very high cost for that at this particular moment in time. But, you know, we get up every day and we work on it and we're advancing it. And, you know, we have a lot of really great people working with us all around the world on it. Um, and it's easy for me to see over the next four or five, six years, uh, having something that is really quite accessible technologically. Okay, Jeffrey, we've been at this for an hour and a half. You've been incredibly generous with your time. I really do hope people check out this book, The Finders, and your website where you can just a ton of information. Once you dive in, you'll find your own path. I can't resist, though, talking about a couple of map versus territory questions because, as we said, you are a social scientist, but you're also a location for and beyond guy, which I'll leave folks to figure out for themselves. What have you learned? What has your personal experience been with some of the things that I care about in terms of this extended consciousness realm that does seem to be out there once we get past this busy, ordinary state that bogs us down minute to minute? So I want to talk about NDEs, psychedelics, Hungry ghosts and demons, shamans and magic, <laughs> ET, all these things are things that interest me. I'll let you pull on any one of those threads to begin with. Sure. So the, in the finders, I, I had to add a chapter on location five and beyond because, frankly, too many people who have just taken the finders course experiment and participated in the finders course experiment have gone there now. And so I would hesitated for a long time in talking about those locations. And, and let me just say why before we get into what you're talking about, which we can totally talk about. I hesitate about talking about these later locations because I think they're a little dangerous. This, is, this goes back to where systems do have tremendous value. You know, like I have an enormous amount of respect for Tibetan Buddhism, for instance. I think that they have a very detailed map um, I think that they have a huge range of methods that are highly and precisely effective across that map. Very difficult for Westerners to get to, I think, um, even very devoted Westerners. And part of that is that because they believe that a lot of those methods only work literally at specific physical places even. And so, and, and some of the, and it's interesting because they've sort of lost, they feel, if you really talk to these guys, they feel like uh, they've sort of lost some of their effectiveness of their system because, you know, the Chinese have taken those places in some cases. And it's, it's all very complicated. But just generically speaking, I have an enormous amount of respect for that particular system and the degree of detail and the fine grain detail and whatnot sort of is associated in it. And one of those things that they provide is the support for these later locations. Like they really understand what's needed when you go to them. They understand that they're, you know, very isolating, their version of them. There's a couple of major versions of them and they sort of have a preferred version of them. And so there is, you know, very isolating, but also somewhat dangerous. And so imagine that you have sort of deconstructed the sense of self down to the point where you're getting to the you're getting so early in your brain's programming. If you just think of your brain as sort of this programmed thing that has been you know, code layered on top of code, layered on top of code, layered on top of code, and you're sort of stripping those off or you're reprogramming them in different ways that are convenient as you go through this process and you get down low enough, you eventually hit things like your actual binding to your sensory system in certain ways. And so what people actually will talk about is literally losing consciousness for periods of time, like having a glitch in the system where they lose consciousness. Um, and, you know, I've talked to people who were found a week in, you know, laying on their floor, rushed to the hospital, you know, were lucky to have lived, 
uh, from doing certain practices that you know move them into these later locations, but we're doing them in an unsupervised way, alone in their apartment. Just go on YouTube and look at sadhus whose arms are deformed because they've held them in a particular position <laughs> for long periods of time. I mean, it's another extension of the same thing of reprogramming down to a level where you're, yeah, but go ahead. Yeah, so it's with that caveat, I just I always want to talk about that caveat before I talk about these later locations, uh, because I think people will hear like, oh, that sounds cool. Uh, but it, I think it's also very important to be realistic about all of this. So in locations five through nine, which is the next batch, we look at one through four as a grouping, we look at five through nine as a grouping. In locations five through nine, and the stuff that you're interested in, one of the things that we often see is um, is actually an increase in accuracy of intuition, uh, what people might call sort of psychic premonitions um, and stuff like that. And I think that that's, that's very interesting. It's been difficult for us to test that on you know a practical level. We have been able to test it in some ways, and also Dean Radin has tested some of these people you know, with some of his pre-sentiment analysis stuff. Um, and I actually haven't asked Dean if he's published that anywhere. I've only talked to him about it. Uh, but he, you know, in conversation says that he's seen very statistically significant differences in these populations of people who are in, you know, PNSC, uh, fundamental well-being. But let's dive into that for a second. Dean Radin just interviewed him a couple months ago. So now he's into the magic thing, right? So now he's like, let's look at yeah. magic and what that means. And as part of that, th the thing that's confusing for me is he says, you know, I never even considered spirit, quote unquote, until a year ago, <laughs> which... On one hand, I get and I appreciate. It. On the other hand, I go, how are you even, you, you know, you got a lot of catching up to do. But the other thing is, so you enter that realm and you say, what does that mean? What does that mean that one of the guys you're going to study claims to have manifested a bunch of crows that flew through his chimney and shit all over the floor? And the next day, the crows weren't there, but the Crow shit was there on the floor for him to see and for everyone else to see. I mean, this is altering reality in a way that doesn't fit with our ordinary understanding. Even if we go location one through four, we get the sense that there is this, again, map versus territory, that there's this territory out there that might be completely different from the map that we normally associate with it. And is that okay? I like as a social scientist saying, you know, don't worry about that. Shut up and calculate become shut up and meditate. I think there's a practical part of that. Yeah. I, you know, I wonder a lot about that as well, because there's certainly, that's a very consistent report in that location five to nine range. And the further someone goes in that location five to nine range, the more integral to their life, those types of reports seem to be. Uh, it's, it's interesting. I was talking to a famous meditation teacher who was here at the house getting stemmed uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, when I say house, we have a facility here that is uh, like a big Silicon Valley style startup house type place uh, where the team lives and uh, where we do a lot of our research. And that's nice because we can have people in and they can stay and, you know, the best conversations always occur off hours and things like that, right? Uh, so you kind of want to facilitate that. And we were talking about locations five through nine, and he was very negative on like the psychic stuff and the psychokinesis stuff um, that comes after location nine and, and stuff like that. He was just like, you know, you cannot sort, his belief was you cannot sort locations. You should not be thinking of that as the primary change that occurs in that location or whatever else. And our point was, well, you know, listen, we're looking at the, the major, we're primarily cognitive science focused and phenomenological, you know, report focused as well. And if that's like the major change in phenomenological reports and a certain, or one of the major changes, then that's a, then that becomes a major category of at least self-reported evidence to us. We're not going to leave that on the table, but it was interesting because he had this very, almost like an, like a, a fervent anti, for God's sakes, don't talk about that kind of way about him. Now he's, he, he's very much like a mainstream sort of teacher, very popular, very mainstream sort of teacher. And uh, I think maybe it, maybe it's a branding decision. I'm not sure. Uh, maybe he just doesn't necessarily want to associate it with his sort of more scientifically oriented meditation brand or something like that. I don't know. But certainly, I think 
I, I certainly cannot deny that this is reported by people in that range as increasingly integral to their interaction with the world. And of course, one of the things that it makes you wonder is, oh, actually, let me tell a couple of other stories. So there have been a number of major, you know, random number generator type research groups and experiments and stuff that have gone on. No doubt you're interested in this area. You're familiar with all of those types of things. Uh, so, you know, there's lots of different devices. There's lots of different researchers and groups that have looked into this all over the world. I was having a conversation with one of those groups one time. And I was asking them about the, and this was way before I was doing this. This was like 2006. It was, a, it was just a random occurrence in my life, really. But I just wound up having dinner with uh, some of them. I asked them about just sort of the internal phenomenological state of people who were able to, were, basically what they said is that, although they didn't talk about it publicly, it seemed like they had like one or two superstars or two or three superstars or something, I don't remember, in their research population. And that when they, their, their results were so, so statistically significant that when they folded that in with the rest of the research population, they got a slight statistical significance for the overall research population, right? But because of their protocol and their IRB and stuff, they couldn't really just pull out those three people and only report those results. But they became interested, obviously, in who those people were and what they were thinking and what their experience of it was and all of that. And they basically described, all of them basically described a dissolution of the individualized sense of self and a sense of merging with the apparatus, with the experimental apparatus was their term for their stuff, experimental apparatus. Um, I had another conversation with another group. This was one of the famous SRI people. Right? So a lot of their stuff is public, and a lot of their stuff is published. And I know one of the things that Russ, uh, Russ Targ has, I'm sure, talked about publicly, so I, I, this can't be a secret, um, is that he basically took this clock off his mantle one day and put some mirrors on it and then like bounced some lasers off those mirrors and then like sort of put it behind a glass panel on one end of a room. And he brought people in and he said, make the pendulum move, you know, which was one of those rotational, not like left-right pendulum, but like one of those rotational pendulums on a mantel clock, right? Um, and he's like, make those move. And he'd set up the lasers to basically detect even the slightest movement with because he was a laser physicist, right? Uh, you know, bouncing off the mirrors. Uh, and this was, you know, government-funded research to the tune of many, many millions of dollars down here in Palo Alto, California. And one day, um, one of their research subjects who thought that this was just the most ludicrous thing that he'd ever been assigned to as part of his internship at SRI, one day he's sitting there and lo and behold, the thing moves and he learns how to move it. When asked about, you know, what was that like for you, he described the same thing. He described it was a sense of a dissolution of my individualized sense of self and a sense of merging with the apparatus. Um, and then somehow I could seem to affect it. And for him, that eventually became a persistent fundamental well-being. He actually used that as a doorway to get to fundamental well-being, which is why I sort of stored these stories in the back of my head over the years, because I think to myself, well, maybe someday we'll be able to invent something like this that is another easier way to access fundamental well-being. Right? And then a third example, another set of research done very, very, if I tell you what the apparatus is, you're going to immediately know who it is. So I'm not going to tell what the apparatus is. But really, really sophisticated apparatus, different than the random number generator stuff. Um, and I just so happened to be there practically the day this apparatus showed up, and I just happened to be hanging out with the scientist in his office, just sort of catching up and talking, hanging out. Um, and their first research subject on the apparatus was in doing, using it, you know, and they were, she was, she popped her head in and she's like, okay, you know, I've got to go home. And he was like, okay, you know, great. Have a good day. Uh, and I'm like, well, hold on, like, let's go look at her results, right? Like, <laughs> like, don't let her away yet, right? And so we go back in and we look and there's like these bar graphs on the screen, if I'm remembering right. And um, most of them look, you know, not statistically significant. And I'm like, what are the bar graphs? And he's like, oh, they're individual trials that were run. I'm like, okay, great. So can you remember what each one of these, I asked her, you know, can, the subject, could you remember what each one of these trials were? And she's like, sure, I remember what I was doing for each one of them. And so I had her walk me through them, walk us through them. And then she gets to the last couple, which were very significant. Like, like you know, imagine like little stubby bar graphs and then really, really tall bar graphs, right? I mean, like there were like a night and day difference clearly between these uh, sessions and the other ones. And I was like, okay, what did you do for this one? And where she'd not previously had any hesitation in answering that question, she paused and you could just see the wheels turning, you know, like, am I going to tell him? <laughs> am I going to admit this? 
Um, and I'm like, you know, listen, think about where you are right now, right? There's nothing that you could say to, to Dean or I that we're not going to be like, okay, whatever. And so finally she's like, okay, well, I can do this thing where it's sort of like I can make me go away. She's like, I know that sounds a little crazy. <laughs> and so she goes on to basically describe the same thing, this dissolution of her sense of self, right, emerging with the experimental apparatus, and those are the two trials that were off the charts or whatever else. And so those types of data points from very disparate labs where I know that in many cases they don't even know each other's stories to exchange information separated by over a decade, um, you know, separated by many decades, if you include the SRI data and probably when that happened, I mean, who knows when that happened. Um, that to me says there's, there, there is a potential for some sort of interface between a reduction in what is the traditional narrative sense of self or the egoic sense of self or the symbolic sense of self or whatever we want to call it. Um, it's, it seems like maybe, I don't know, you know, it's not something I'm working actively on or whatever, but just looking at these different data presentations, looking, it's been reported to us from research subjects, from their own phenomenological experience or whatever. It seems possible at least that, that the normal sense of self is just using so much of the system and has so much noise generated in the system that when that, the more that quiets down and the more, you know, the more the system has the capacity to just listen to something going on in the background, you know, we can't be physically separated from the underlying quantum reality. We've all got to be connected at some energetic level in some way. It's not inconceivable to me that there's a potential mechanism of communication there or that there's some degree of sensing that. Uh, in some way. It could be, I have nothing to do with quantum stuff. I mean, I don't know, right? But you, just the fact that you and I think that we're separate or that I think that I'm separate from this house or something, and you know, I don't actually anymore. My own personal experience of the world doesn't feel separate. Uh, but I remember when I did, and certainly most people would say that they do feel that way. Um, that, you know, that just doesn't seem accurate from a physics perspective, right? And so I don't, I don't it doesn't seem unreasonable to me that our system would evolve in such a way that I need to, you know, eat, poop, take care of my child, you know, I need a certain level of cognition in my system in order to do all that. But perhaps if you can just keep quieting that system down more and more and more and more, access to other things become possible. And then even on the PK front, right, the psychokinesis front, which is the academic term for moving stuff with your mind and making stuff manifest and whatever, even on that front, I think it's an interesting question, right? Because I can clearly move my hand and my arm pretty easily. What if that thing is equally possible? So what we see from location 10 on is increased reports of what people basically feel are like increased skill with what they would call, you know, the type of psychokinesis or mind matter interaction. And I have to say, I've seen some crazy stuff over the years, but I'm not a magician, right? Like it's pretty easy to fool me with that stuff. And so I always have to keep that in mind. I can't tell how Penn and Teller is doing a trick, right? If they're like, I did that with my mind, I'd be like. Yeah, but I think Russell Targ and those guys had a pretty good handle on it. I mean, the protocol for some of those experiments is pretty freaking simple. So I, I, I never like that, uh, those kind of skeptical explanations, you know, which are so more easily debunked than the other. But leaving that for a minute, because one more topic that, and I don't even know if you want to go there, but I just published an interview couple episodes ago with a, a guy, Navy guy, 20 year veteran who was part of this UFO disclosure. That was the largest UFO disclosure in history. It happened in December of 2017 and was in the wall street journal and it was on Fox news and CBS news and it was everywhere. It was the disclosure effort. And if you blinked, you missed it because it didn't get any traction. So I don't know where they're going with that. That's a whole other story, but they came out and said, yeah, okay, we haven't told you the truth. This stuff really happens. Here's a program. Here's the video of it. It happened off the coast of San Diego. So the guy I interviewed, Kevin Day, says, yeah, I was on board. It was incredible. You know, these things, how is how we tracked him. And I had this encounter experience. Now, the reason I got even interested in all this is because I was interested in the near-death experience science, if you will. And then some folks have started to do the 
experiencer science as well as they can in terms of looking at what that experience looks like across various people, trying to sort through that data. And there's a big overlay with the near-death experience. It turns out a lot of times these are more spiritually transformative than we previously thought, although they break into different groups. I don't want to get too far afield. No, that's definitely true. We've interfaced with a lot of those researchers. Here's the point that intrigues me. If we accept this encounter experience, and the guy I interviewed, Kevin Day, says it was very traumatic for me, particularly because I had all these symptoms that manifested like PTSD, complex PTSD, and I'm going to the vet, and they're going, that's what it is. And I'm going, yeah, but that doesn't quite fit. And then he comes across Jacques Vallée, Davis, this research that they compiled on encounters and the after effects of encounters. And he goes, bingo, that's it. Everything they're saying there across all these people who have had these encounters fits my experience. Here's the question. It's pointing towards a technology. It's really pointing towards a technology that there is this consciousness out there and whether it's manifested in whatever these forms are, whatever these others are, they seem to demonstrate the ability to manipulate this consciousness realm in a way that we kind of understand and then kind of completely don't understand. Telepathy is an example. Screen memory is an example. Emoting telepathically, causing you to emote certain kind of things, you know, whether they're sexual or uh, not feeling things and all this stuff. What do you think about ET? Have you bumped into that at all? Are you willing to be open to that? And what do you think about, in particular, what I think about, what do you think about what that might suggest for advanced capabilities along these scales that you're already on, right? Because if you're on this path of protocols and technology to move you across this scale or location path, might that be somewhere along that path? It's a good question. I, I am definitely not an expert on in the ET space. Um, I can say that I've had a couple of, um, a couple, I have had a couple of subjects in the early years mention it, uh, mention some sort of involvement with ETs and their spiritual development. Um, more broadly from that, there are plenty of people who talk about, you know, beings and stuff like that as a part. There are some people who transition to especially further forms of fundamental well-being that, like later locations, who have reported only having those transitions occur when certain, when, when like a, some being will materialize and like just like zap them into some other location. And then the being will dematerialize, right? Now, that could be their brain hallucinating in the middle of a shift or who knows what it could be, right? Um, so I think it's a good question. I don't know. I've known um, – I mean, the thing is I don't think you have to go to extraterrestrial technology for that type of stuff. And, you know, you spend any time at all in the brainstem space and eventually you run across some of the people who have worked in sort of the black projects for the U.S. government doing, you know, non-invasive brain stimulation stuff. Um, and it's pretty clear that they were that they were able to use microwaves. I mean, the reason we use ultrasound is because we're you know we're a little concerned that if we use microwaves, we're going to get a visit, you know, from people telling us to please stop that in the in the name of national security or something. You know, I don't know. But you know, I mean, I know researchers who have been involved in some of this stuff that have they've clearly been through magnetic stimulation. They've clearly been through different forms of stimulation, and they've clearly had success with generating emotion for instance, in people, or eliciting orgasm even, or um, whatever else. And so I don't think you necessarily have to go to ET technology. Yeah, but it becomes a chicken and the egg kind of question. If you get very far into it, and I realize that, so I don't want to pull you too far afield, but yeah. the technology sharing... Uh, I actually know enough about the linear development of that technology, and who did it at what point over decades, to know to, to be able to see that as a as a as a highly experimented linear human developmental path, which is why I use it as an example. I mean, you know, I think there were some significant missteps and some horror stories and anytime you're stimulating the brain with different things. And, you know, so I've had some interaction with, with some folks like that who really believe 
you know, who, who mostly just, you know, sort of came out to us and said, you know, listen, you should take this brain stuff seriously. You're on the right track. I can't say anything more specific than what I'm going to tell you here today, you know, for legal reasons. But, you know, yes, you know, and, you know, and, 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 and from those people, I've, I've roughly gotten a, a chronology of what technologies were experimented with when, where the ideas came from. You know, that a lot of that stuff is not classified in any way. And so that was sort of the stuff that they can help you to paint a, pi a directional picture around and stuff like that. And so, so I, I certainly, I mean, you know, it's a massive universe out there, right? We're probably not alone, who knows? Uh, but I haven't seen anything in this space. I haven't had to deal with that in any way in this space from a data standpoint, except for a couple of subjects. Um, early on in the research, um, I do think that I do think that these promises hold tremendous. And if I mean, yeah, if you're able to, if there's some being out there who's able to go across galaxies in an instant, probably they've developed brain computer interfaces, whatever that might be to their species, to a level that is astonishing from our perspective, right? Uh, and that would be hugely beneficial to this project. I can't. Would I want them to show up in my living room tomorrow? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe I'm happy with the slow plotting methodical path. If that's the case, I don't know. Very location three there. <laughs> <laughs> I might be willing to sacrifice the progress for you know whatever I don't have to have done to me. <laughs> I don't know what stuff to say. This is joking around, but no, I, I get you. You know, uh, our folks, our guest again has been. Dr. Jeffrey Martin. You can check out his website, drjeffreymartin.com. But there's a new book, The Finders. I introduced it at the beginning. It's a very important book if you're at all interested in well-being, your well-being, the planet's well-being, everyone's well-being. Check it out. It's been fantastic having you on, Jeffrey, and reconnecting. Anything we left out or any place else that people need to go to connect with this? You know, I think there is one place. Um, I mean, of course, there's the normal websites and stuff, which I'm sure you stick up on your page. Um, but there is one thing, at least it's alive at the time of this interview. Um, and it's at something called explorerscourse.com, which is our follow-on project. Um, what we've done is we've put up a series of videos that we think are important for anyone to know about their psychology for those who have transitioned to fundamental well-being already. Um, you know, oftentimes when someone has transitioned to fundamental well-being, it's in, it's often in isolation. They're generally not in a community. As a result of that, they think that they're like the only one who has experienced certain things or they wonder about what's going to unfold next or, um, and the reality is that there's very reliable cycles. Um, it's very useful to know about them. And, you know, there's the sort of trade-offs that they're making in their own life, the difficulties that they're experiencing with integrating in PNSC and fundamental well-being in their own life. Um, these are things that have been experienced by millions of people. Um, and we've got data collected on them from thousands of people. And so we've really tried to sort of put the most important thing out there. And it's just, you know, it's just free, basically. You just can go to explorerscourse.com and you can get that free uh, chunk. We basically, it's the first module of the actual Explorers course, which is another experiment that isn't free. But that first module contains so much of the important core situational, you know, help you understand your life sort of stuff that everybody, everybody that took that course was like, you know, you should just make this available. This has to be available to people. If I would have had this years ago, my life would have been so totally different. And so I was thought, you know, why not? So we just basically put it up there. You can't even actually order at this moment. Maybe we should change that. But you can't even order the Real Explorers course or get to the Real Explorers course or anything for that website, which is kind of funny. It's literally just that content. We just want really as many finders, uh, as many people who experience fundamental well-being as possible to really find that so they can understand, you know, how, what's going on with them and sort of how best to think about integrating it in with modern life. Because what's strange about this is that there's just not much on it. People often find Adi Ashanti's book, The End of Your World, and like cling to it like a Bible, you know, like it's the one thing that they found that speaks to them in some way. Um, and of course, they can read all of the seeker spiritual stuff, right? And they're reading it from a completely new lens and understanding it. Uh, at a much more deeper and meaningful level, but that's not telling them how to integrate stuff with their life. 
It's just, you know, giving them a little bit of validation that they've probably reached a certain place that these other people that wrote the book or something or had reached and understood. I do think that that's actually one thing that we have out there that we didn't really talk about, uh, but that is incredibly, incredibly important. It's one of, I think maybe that's one of the most important things that we've ever made available. Great, great stuff. You know, I've stumbled across that just in the near-death experience science. Everyone 10 years ago was all excited and this and that. And there were a couple of brave people who stood up and said, same kind of thing. Hey, guys, there's a huge integration problem here. There's a huge divorce rate increase. There's a huge depression kind of thing going on. So, yeah, I think you're, you're on to something, and it's awesome that you're addressing it. Well, thanks so much. You know, I love hanging out and talking with you. We've, I don't know, we've had as long a conversation on camera, I suppose, as off camera. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sitting yeah, at well, lunch or something, but... <clears throat> This is always a lot of fun. Yeah, it, it's super fun for me, and I, I really do appreciate it. Hopefully, I, I make it up there sometime, and I'd love to see the the place that you go. Oh, you should have. totally come. Okay. You should totally come and try out our latest technology. Deal, 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 deal. Jeffrey, take care. I'll give you a, a heads up when this comes out. All right, thanks. Thanks again to Dr. Jeffrey Martin for joining me today on Skeptico. One question I'd have to tee up from this interview is, has he done it? Has he cracked the code? Is this the answer? Could there be such an answer to this enlightenment, transcendent, awakening kind of thing? Has he at least advanced the ball in a direction that we all want to take things? What do you think? Let me know. This was a long interview, so I'm going to wrap it up. But if you like this one and you're new to this show, please check out all the other shows we have on Skeptico, all available there for download for free. Lots of transcripts you can read through, lots of stuff. You can keep yourself busy for a long time with Skeptico.com. Got some great interviews coming up. Stick around for all of that. Until next time, take care and bye for now. So thanks for watching this video. And if it wasn't really a video, but just an audio stored as a video, I apologize. But there's more videos out there as well. But please check out the Skeptico website. You can see it here. We cover a lot of different stuff you might be interested in relating to controversial science and spirituality. A lot of shows up there, over 350 of them or so, all free, all available for download. So do check it out. <music>